Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Obedience is the very best way to show that we believe. And uh, that touches a little bit upon the topic that we have before us today. If you've looked in the bulletin, that you, then you know that a title for it could be um, obedience, the, the Courage to Act. And I think this is something that is applicable to everyone. There are times when we should do things and we don't do them. And there are times, obviously, when we do things that we shouldn't do. Uh, and in a world that is hostile and increasingly so uh, toward the gospel and toward righteousness, toward uh, real standards, it can be even more uh, difficult um, uh, to act when we should. Today, in Judges chapter 4, if you open your Bibles to that place, we'll look at a couple of different individuals. It's an interesting chapter uh, for a variety of reasons, but we'll look at, some, at a couple of specific individuals that did act and uh, look at what they did, why they did it, uh, what happened as a result of it. And we'll also throw in a third group of people uh, that uh, also acted, but we don't know much about them. All of them are important, and this is an important thing to recognize, right? The Bible, the Bible tells us that, that the real believers in Christ, their body. Uh, we have fingers, we have toes, we have knees and a nose and all the different parts, some that are external and, vi and visible, and all of the real important stuff is on the uh, on the inside, right? The uh, the machinery that keeps it going, the lungs and the heart, and all those uh, the, the the big blood vessels and the small ones, uh, all that stuff, right? It's all it's all valuable. Judges chapter four. Um, there's 24 verses in the chapter. And we'll go through the whole thing because uh, because we need to do that to, to cover the material that we have in front of us. Uh, but let's go ahead and ask the Lord to to bless the time that we have again, and then we'll begin in verse number one. Father, we come before you, and we ask you to bless your word. Uh, help us to concentrate and focus. Help us to receive uh, any kind of specific uh, application that we need to make on an individual basis. Strengthen us, encourage us, uh, motivate us to be what you'd have us to be, to be obedient. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, chapter, no, if you, okay even before we get to, uh, to chapter 4, we understand the book of Judges. God has kept his promise to Israel, which he made four centuries earlier to Abraham. Uh, he has brought them out of Egyptian slavery. They have crossed the Red Sea. They have gone through the wilderness, although it took a lot longer than it should have. It should have been a 12-day trip, ended up being a 40-year trip, not because they were uh, stopping to smell the roses, but because they were, they were suffering as a result of their disobedience, as their lack of faith. And so, uh, by the time the book of Joshua opens up, God brings them into the land of Canaan, the place he had promised to give to Abraham, and now his descendants are in it. And they're entering into it, and the instructions that God gave to Abraham 400 years earlier, or to Moses anyway, 40 years earlier, are still applicable. All of those inhabitants were supposed to be, were supposed to be driven out, either exterminated or uh, let them run for their lives, whatever the case is, and Israel didn't do that. And so as you look at the book of Judges, you get a cycle of, of, of history of, of Israel. There were times when Israel was dominant in their own territory, uh, the land God had given to them. And then they would get soft and they would uh, lose their focus, lose their edge, if you want to put it that way. They would drift away from God. They would embrace idolatry. They would desire to become more like these heathen nations that God uh, said were abominable, had done abominable things. And Israel, God's people, they began to adopt more and more that kind of that kind of lifestyle. As a result, God would, like any loving parent, uh, he tried to wake them up. He tried to draw them back to a healthy relationship with him and one that would be beneficial, especially in the Old Testament, right? We understand that God's promises to Israel were not just were not just spiritual, they were also very physical. You know, he if Israel would be obedient to God. They wouldn't have to worry about war in their country. They wouldn't have to worry about sickness in their country. They wouldn't have to worry about bad harvests, you know, climate change of any kind. Forget about it. It wasn't going to happen. If Israel was faithful to God, then they were going to, uh, well, they were going to be on easy street, put it that way. Uh, and Israel, they had the good times, and then they would, they would fall away. And oftentimes we recognize that throughout history, the times when we have been most prosperous and most secure are the times when we have, have drifted away from God. We've gotten fat, which is what uh, God warned Israel about. And he said uh, they'd gotten fat and they'd kicked. They had, uh, they had decided they wanted to explore some other things. They were tired, uh, tired of living um, uh, in God's blessing. 
And so they want to try something else. And that was that was disastrous. So in any case, this is this is the cycle that keeps happening in Judges. And in chapter, as chapter four opens up, this is how it begins. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in Harasheth of the Gentiles. And, okay, so that, that's enough. The children of Israel again did evil. This, like I said, it's a cycle. The first time that this has happened uh, was back in the, in the previous chapter, and they had uh, they had served under a king for eight years and then been free for 40 after God sent a deliverer. The second time, chapter three again, they served 18 years under a different king in bondage. Uh, their land was occupied. And then after they were set free from that, there was 80 years of peace. 80 years of peace, that's a long time for us, uh, you know, as, as people. A lot of people, they don't even make it to 80. So they could live their whole life, be born and live in peace and freedom and stability and security. And maybe they could see at the end of it their society that God had ordered starting to fall apart, disintegrate, you know, depart from, from uh, what it should have been. But there was no foreign occupation. There was no invasion. There was no, there was no real hammer drop. Uh, during their life, and and they, uh, you know, they they, it's like being in the eye of a hurricane. Uh, they 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 didn't have any of the turbulent winds, so that was 80 years of peace. Now here we are, uh, the third time, and they're going to be in bondage, uh, as verse three says. Um, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord for he had. Uh, wait a minute, yeah, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord for he that is sister, not the Lord, had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years. He mightily oppressed the children of Israel. So that's the situation. One quick uh, application that we can make from even these first three verses that we've read is that there is a tendency in us to be pretty short-sighted. Not only can we not see very far ahead, but we also don't seem to have a very good memory of what's happened in the past. We easily forget things, and oftentimes people uh, people have the idea that that this time it's different whatever this is, whether it's economic questions or whether it's moral questions or whether, you know, some some change in society, this time it's different. Yeah, it, it, our parents tried this and it went badly for them, but we know better. We have their experience to go on. But for whatever reason, it doesn't seem to matter uh, for, for in, in many cases. And so let me just say this to start with, and that is God's word is God's word and it doesn't change. And so the things that God says are true, and righteous and upright are still the things that are true and righteous and upright. This time it's not different. It's only a question of, of if we're going to be obedient to God's word or whether we're going to walk away from it and, and put ourselves in the crosshairs uh, of judgment. It's not different. Verse number three, you see that uh, after 20 years of mighty oppression, that the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And that phrase, the children of Israel, that, that's a that's a that's that's a plurality. That's more than one. This wasn't just a call from one person for God to do something. This was a general thing that had happened. Israel as a nation had not just had not just suffered and suffered mightily. They had gotten to the point where they were willing to do something different. They were willing to return to God. And of course, in our own city, in our own country, this is something that we need to see as well. A general turning back to God, a revival that would be that would be uh, changing the way that people look at things and the way that they act, and it may it begin here with us. So here you have Sisera, nine hundred chariots, verse number four, and Deborah or Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth. She judged Israel at that time. She dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Beth Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. Okay, so now we have the bright spot. We have the one that God is going to use to, to try to put things back on track. Uh, this lady, Deborah, who is a wife, who is a mother, she says in, in, the, next, in, in the next chapter. Uh, what else she did, we don't know. But she was a godly person, and she was honored and respected, not just within her own family as the matriarch of a, uh, uh, of a godly family. And truth be told, we don't know anything much about her husband. We, we, we have a name here. We don't know what her family was like, but whatever they did, whatever their relationship with God was, she was independent of that. I mean, every one of us has our own relationship with God. 
I can't give mine to my kids and I can't take mine from somebody else. I remember being in college reading a book. It's, it's still available. A fellow named A.W. Tozer, he wrote a book. Uh, uh, what is it? Be Holy? How to Be Holy? I forget the title right now. The Knowledge of the Holy. Of the holy. Uh, it's a classic. And one of the statements in that book is this. <laughs> Every man is as close to God as he has chosen to be. Nobody can keep you from God if you want to seek him. No bar. No problem, no health issue, no economic distress or abundance. If you want to find God and if you want to draw close to God, he will meet you. Right. And that's what the Bible tells us. You shall seek for me and you shall find me when you shall seek for me with all your heart. That's Old Testament. In the book of Acts, Paul preached in Athens that God is not far off. You know, in him we live and move and have our being. He's close if you want to be close to him. And so whether your family is or not, whether your neighborhood is or not, whether in the past your other relations have been or not, has nothing to do with anything. It can be a convenient excuse to hide behind. You can try to tell yourself that you've got two strikes against you already and, and, and you have a lot of uh, things to overcome. Uh, but do we or do we not believe in a God that helps us to overcome things, a God that can make us more than conquerors, right? And so and so, it's not an excuse. You can be close to God if you want to. And while we don't know anything about her family, we know that she was, and she was respected. And people people in, in, in different counties, people in different tribes, they would come to her for instruction and wisdom. Verse number six the Bible says she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor and take with thee 10,000 men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun? And I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon, Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. Okay, so here's, here's, here's the situation. Israel has been occupied for 20 years, mightily oppressed. And now the time has come and God has said, it is time for me to set my people free again. And so apparently he's already spoken to Barak and he's already told him to do this. Because it seems like when Deborah calls him, she's just reminding him of what he's already been told. So you have this mighty oppression. You have these iron chariots. You have the cutting edge dominant military force of its time um and then you have barack and she calls him and says the lord's called you and this is not going to be some some guerrilla raid some commando mission no no uh, uh, uh i don't know what the hebrew word for seal is but this is not going to be the seal team six that goes in and does some kind of surgical strike just on the headquarters i'm going to bring to you the whole army of sisera and all those 900 iron chariots and all of his horses, and they're coming for you. But don't worry, because I'm going to bring, I'm going to deliver them into your hands. So it's a tall order, and it's awfully easy for us to read this and just read it. But if you try to put yourself into the biblical narrative, if you try to imagine a situation like this, uh, the Bible becomes much more real, and you can identify with these people. You know, oftentimes the devil wants us to think that the Bible is a uh, it's a hall of fame. It's a museum. It's for a super select elite group that, okay, that was Bible guys and those are Bible women and those are Bible times. And here I am, you know, this is 21st century. Makes no difference. God hasn't changed. Right. And if you read the Bible, you find the Bible does record the weaknesses of these heroes who had faith. You do find that the Bible says, for example, about Elijah, he was a man subject to like passions like we are. He was just a guy, but he had a prayer life that God listened to. He had a prayer life that could lock up the heavens. He had a prayer life that could bring rain in, in conjunction with God's timing and God's will. You can do that. You can do that today. Now, I'm not saying you know, we're going to have this side pray for rain, this side not pray for rain. Just saying you can be as close to God as you want to be. Now, how God uses you. And then what he sends you to do, that's that's between him and you, right? But here's here's what here's here's the deal. God says, I'm gonna bring him. 
and I'm going to bring him to the riverbank, to, 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 to flat territory. I'm going to bring him to great chariot country. Okay, we're not going to we're not going to fight it amongst the hills. You're not going to hide between the rocks and fall on them from the jungles and stuff like that. I'm going to bring them to the plain, and I want you to meet them. You and ten thousand. Okay, great. Off we go, or not. If you read chapter five, you'll find out later on that as they sing their song of victory, following a Sisera's defeat, that she says they were uh, one of the verses here, uh, verse eight. They chose, uh, then was war in the gates. Was there a shield or spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? Weapons were hard to come by for the Israelis at the time because, like good oppressors, uh, uh, Jabin and his gang wanted to demilitarize uh, the people that they were trying to oppress. And so I don't know what it was that this 10,000 plus Barak had going for them rocks and sticks, slings, and I don't know. Now, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. But in any case, it wasn't up to the task. Except God said he was going to turn, he, he was going to give them the victory. The same God that did it in Israel or in, in Egypt, the same God that did it in, in uh, you know, at Jericho. This is an almighty God. So, yes, he is purposefully stacking the deck against his side just to show that God overcomes anything and everything. When he chooses to do so. So this is verse number six. This is the word. Barak, you gather your 10,000 and uh, you go fight with Sisera and company. Okay, now again, this is God who does things differently. We know later on, just a couple of chapters from now, God's going to introduce us, introduce to a guy named Gideon. And Gideon also is going to be tasked with delivering Israel. And Gideon's got a lot going for him. He doesn't think he does, but he managed to cobble together over 30,000 troops. And God says, mm, too many. We got to thin this, got to thin this down some. I don't want people to think that you won the victory. And so 30,000, you remember, shrinks down to 300. And God says, great. Now, this is the select group that I want to use. And we're not, and this final 300, they weren't the, uh, you know, the elite special forces guys that could already had the, everything bombed and they were just going to, you know, twist buttons and call in drone strikes and stuff like that. Just 300 guys. So God used 300 that time. This time, God specifically wants 10,000. Why does God want 10,000? I don't know. God does what he does. He chooses what he chooses. He wants 10,000. And so that's verse number uh, verse 6 and 7. I will deliver him into thine hand. And now we get to verse 8. And Barak uh, said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. So here's where we have our first our first example of the courage to act. Here's Barak. Now understand, Deborah, she was a godly woman. She was a wise person. God was in touch with her, absolutely. But God didn't choose her to be an Amazon. He didn't put a sword in her hand and say, you go lead these people down here. No, her job was to call Barak to do it. Barak's job was to actually go down into the valley and, and do what needed to be done on the battlefield. Kind of like Moses and Joshua earlier, right? When Moses went up on the mountain to pray at the time of, of the battle and sent Joshua and Israel against uh, those other folks. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a relationship here. It's, it's all the parts working together. And we have our hero, and in Hebrews chapter 11, his name appears. He's one of the guys that shows up in that chapter along with Moses and Abraham and uh, et cetera. And Barak says, I'll go if you'll go. But if you're not going, I'm not going. Now, we can look at this from a, from a positive perspective, but we shouldn't. The positive perspective, although this is, good, this is a good application, there's a lot of people that are willing to send other people to do things, but don't want to do them themselves. This is not a case where Deborah is saying, oh, Barak, there's a problem over there. Why don't you go take care of that? No, that's not the deal. God wanted Barak to do this, and he actually, I think, wanted him to do it just because God had told him to do it. And if he uses Deborah to remind him, okay, you do it. That's your job, Barak. And But he says, I'll go if you'll go. But if not, I won't. You know, this is kind of similar in the New Testament to different things. 
uh, for example, when when uh, Peter uh, protested that if everybody denied Christ, that he wouldn't. And then the Bible says, and all the apostles said, oh, yeah, yeah me too. That, that's us too. We're, we're, we agree with that. And then, of course, you know, Peter denied the Lord three times and the rest didn't have a chance because they just ran. Um, and yet at the same time, the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes that that if, if one person is able to be overthrown, two people can withstand and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. It's important that we support each other. It's important, for example, just to start with, that we show up for church. Our presence here is a strengthening and encouraging uh, force for each other. Aside from the ministry you can have as you listen to each other and bear each other's burdens and, and make those uh, social connections that are, that are important as brothers and sisters. So he says, I'll go if you'll go. That's not what, that's not what you want to hear in your general. <laughs> I'll go if you'll go. If not, count me out. This is, this is absolute disobedience to God. God's already told him to go do it. And he says, I will if you will. That's not the right attitude to have. Now, we're getting ready here next Sunday to, to, to launch a, an early version of Missions Month. And what does God want each of us to do? Maybe it doesn't include getting a passport and, and jumping on a plane. But God certainly wants us to take the gospel to New York City and to the other places that we have access to. Uh, so it's not a question of looking around to see who's going who's gonna, to who, who's gonna go first. But, you know, maybe you've seen movies like this where uh, you, you have all the, all the soldiers are lined up and then the commander asks for a volunteer and everybody else takes a step back. <laughs> And so now you got these two guys or whatever guys, and they find out, uh, okay, you're, congratulations, you're selected. So, uh, what, selected for what? I, I'm gonna, I, can, I go, can I go back there and join them? <laughs> That's not the point. But you know what? Somebody's got to step up. Someone has to say, this is what God's called me to do, and I'm going to do it. And when you do that, other people will join you. There's a lot of people that want to see things happen, but they don't want to be the point guard. They don't want to be one to stand up and, and talk or organize or do. You give them something to do. You give them a supporting and valuable role. Oh, sure. Happy to do that. I just don't want to be in charge of the thing. Well, somebody step up and you'll find other people coming alongside to work with you, to cooperate. God will bring people to help you, just like he did for David. But here's here's Barack. I'll go if you'll go. We can't do that. We got to be the one that goes in obedience, in faith, and then wait wait for God to, to send the reinforcements. And you know, he's already told him, I want you to go with 10,000. It's not just going to be you. It is not a solo operation. There's going to be 10,000 of you guys once you get them together. But he still says the 10,000 is not enough. God's command isn't enough for me. I want you to go with me. Who knows what kind of a role, what kind of an influence that you have in your brothers, in your sisters, in your children, in your parents, in your neighbors. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to have a big title. But you could be the one that puts something in motion that will result in a transformation of our society. So, 10,000, he says in verse, uh, verse 8. So, verse 9, she says, okay, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor. For the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kedesh. Okay, so we understand, we think we know what's going to happen. She's the one that this whole thing hinges on, even though she's not the boss, even though she's not the commanding general. The whole thing hinges on her, right? And we understand those of us who have, you know, those of us who have wives. I feel sorry for you who are wives because you can't have a wife of your own. But for those of us who have wives, we understand what a big support that our wives are to us. So he says, okay, you're going to, we're, we're, we're all going to go. We're all going to go. But the honor is not going to be yours because it's going to be a woman that actually gets you know, the final blow in. 
we assume, if we haven't read the story yet, that it's going to be Deborah, because she's the one that is going to put the whole thing in motion, even though she's not the head of the thing. So in verse number 10, Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kedesh, and he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went up with him. Here's the middle group, the 10,000. Who are they? Well, we know where they're from. We have no names. We have no uh, resumes, right? No, no curriculum vitae about what their where qualifications were. They were anonymous, but they were essential. This was not an add-on that Barak requested. This was part of God's plan from the beginning. And this falls into the application of the fact that even if our names are never known on earth, they are known to God. God knows who those 10,000 were. And, and our role, if we're one of the 10,000, is as vital as those whose names have been recorded in, in the scripture. Let me ask you this. If we went around the room and we asked each person here who has been born again who it was that presented the gospel to them, I bet there aren't many of the people you would name that are familiar to us. It's a relative, it's a coworker, it's somebody who maybe has not even ever been in this church. We don't know any of them, maybe. And yet, look at what they've done, how God has used them in your life. And each of us can do the same thing. The people that we know, uh, we can be the one that carries the light to them. And maybe they will be the Barack and the and the and the sister, the Barack and the Deborahs. You know, uh, many of you you know who Charles Spurgeon is, is slash was a great preacher. And um, I think it was I think when he was saved, he was the only person who was saved in his church that year. He was just, he was a he was a youngish guy, and the pre preacher was preaching, and he was like he's like he was preaching right to Spurgeon. Spurgeon later wrote, he was the only guy saved in the church that year, but he went on to have an outsized influence for God uh, that continues to this day. He's one of those that being dead yet speaketh, right? So the point is, you know, Moody and Moody's the, the, the Sunday school teacher that led him to Christ when he was a shoe salesman and on and on it goes. Whoever it was that brought you to Christ, that led you to Christ, that showed the gospel to you, where are they now? Are they famous? Are they well-known? Maybe not. Maybe so. But in any case, that's the 10,000. And you know, 10,000 is a whole lot more than two. 10,000 is the bulk of the force here. So be one of the 10,000. If God doesn't call you to be Barack or Deborah, be one of the 10,000. Do your job. Take the gospel. Be faithful. Step up. Be one of those. So verse 10, they all go up. Verse 11, now the, now the, the story changes. We've gone from a, from a, a, a war kind of issue. Now we have fields and we have flocks and we have uh, a different, different scene. Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, good, uh, good uh, um, heritage there, being related to Moses, had severed himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent into the plain of Zaanaim, which is by Kedesh. And they showed Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, was gone up to Mount Tabor. And Sisera gathered together all his chariots, 900 of them, of iron, all the people that were with him from his place, Harasheth of the Gentiles, unto the river of Kishon. And Deborah said unto Barak, up, go up, get up. This is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. And you know, she said that before the battle. She said it to motivate him. She said it to encourage him. Victory will be yours, but you got to go get it. You know, God, God, and we know other times God sent angels to just eliminate 180,000 soldiers. Boom, battle's over before it ever started. That wasn't here. You're going to have to fight with them. You and these 10,000. David had to fight with Goliath. God could have knocked Goliath off anytime he wanted to. He wanted David to do it. 
so that people could see God using David. On we go. So Deborah said, oh, this is the day that the Lord's delivered them into your hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after. He's on the mountain, right? And God's sending him, okay, go down to the chariot territory. Go to the flatlands. Go to the parking lot. I know they have they have the cars. You know, they've got monster trucks. You're on foot. Go to the parking lot. And that's where the battle is going to be fought. And verse 15 says, the Lord discomfited. That's not a word we use very often. He routed them. He discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and all his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot. Right? He jumped off, fled away on his feet. But Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host unto the hometown, Harasheth of the Gentiles. And all the host of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left. You know, you can't really be much more specific than that. There was not one survivor out of all that Canaanite multitude, except for the big fish. Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. All right, so now here's where, here's where she comes into the story. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, fear not. And when he had turned in unto her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle, right, with a, with, a, with a blanket. And he said unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink. I'm thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk, gave him drink, and covered him. Again he said unto her, Oh, stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be when any man doth come and inquire of thee and say, Is there any man here? Thou shalt say, No. Okay, verse 20. Everything's good, right? Sisera has escaped. Man, what a what a bloody mess there was behind him. Never did he think it was going to turn out that way. But anyway, he's free. He's found a place of safety. He can take his breath. He can relax. He can get some rest. And then he can figure out, I don't know, maybe this whole thing's going to blow over. Maybe they're not going to miss him. Maybe, you know, uh, he's got a chance. Verse 21. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples, fastened him to the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said unto him, Come, I'll show you the man whom thou seekest. And when he came into her tent, behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temples. So God subdued on that day Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the children of Israel, and the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. This is what Israel never did very much of. They, they pressed on until they had total victory. Not just we win the field, we won the battle, let's go home and celebrate. They pursued until there was no enemy left. It was a total victory. Okay, so here's the second person, the courage to act. Here you are. Let's put ourselves in the same situation. Here's this guy. You know the guy. And obviously, if those of you who are so inclined, you can write a novel about this, the, the backstory behind Sisera and Jael and Heber and all the, anyway, we don't know. The Bible doesn't say. We know he felt safe there. We know that there was peace between her husband and between Jabin. And here's where the courage to act shows up. Even if there was peace between her husband, her family, and this king, that doesn't mean there was peace between her and him. See that? The point is, her husband maybe would have given Sisera refuge. Her husband maybe would have welcomed him as a friend and protected him and, and, and got him further back behind the lines or something. Dale said no. This guy, this guy's bad news. This guy is an enemy to Israel, and I am not going to let him get away. So here you are. Put yourself in her place. Here he is. The idea comes into your head. Well, better an idea comes into your head than something else, right? <laughs> the idea comes into your head. There's a, there's, there's a hammer, and there's a tent peg, and there's the two of us. 
Sure, he's big. Sure, he's strong. Sure, he's experienced. Sure, he's a military guy. Here I am, a housewife, a mother. Well, I don't know. I'm not sure about her, but here I am, minding my own business. Never, you know, didn't expect this to happen today. It happens a lot in the Bible. You know that? Things happen that people didn't expect. And you just have to be ready when they do happen. Because those things, they test who you are. It's not a test you can cram for. It's something you've got to be up on, you know, all the time. Walking with God, trusting God, looking to serve God. And when the opportunities pop up, they don't catch you by surprise. They catch you prepared. Hammer. Peg. Enemy. Head. <laughs> Now, really, what would you do? Would you say, oh, I hope he doesn't wake up. I hope he's not angry. I hope he, uh, well, I don't know. I hope the Israelites don't, you know, wipe us out. I, I, what would you do? What did she do? She acted in a pretty decisive way. And as a result of her action, in spite of perhaps the deal, the understanding that her husband had with Jabin, if you go on to read chapter 5, which we won't do, but it says in this victory song that she would be, in verse uh, 24, blessed above women shall Jael, the wife of Heba the Kenite, be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. And it goes on a little bit. What she did was a good thing, but she had the courage to act. So as we wrap this thing up, in my part of it anyway, we have two people. We have Barak. Mr. Gung-Ho military guy who's going to go down in the field of battle and he says, I'm not moving unless you move first. Deborah says, okay, I'll go. But the responsibility was his. He'd already been told what to do. He just wasn't doing it. Now you have JL. The other end of the spectrum. Absolutely. Lady in her tent. And the battle comes to her or at least the lone survivor of the bad guys, comes to her. And she's got an opportunity that she probably never expected. But here it sits. Here it lays right in front of her. And she acts. So for us, looking ahead to Missions Month and looking ahead just to the rest of the day, do we have the courage to act? Are we waiting for somebody else to do it? Or are we willing to say, I guess there's an opening here for me. I'll step up. I'm not saying I'm the best at it. I'm not saying I'm, I'm super qualified. But if it needs to be done, I'll take a shot at it anyway. And if somebody else, after I've started doing something, wants to come up and say, oh, let me give you some advice. Let me give you some help. Hey, great. I'm willing to turn it over to somebody more qualified. I'm just getting the ball rolling here. Once it starts rolling, somebody else can do what needs to be done. It's that willingness to say, I'll do it. God, you need it done. I'll do it. I'll try. You can help me or, or, or directly or, or send help to me. Here am I, Lord. Send him. <laughs> send her. I'm happy where I am. Kind of leave me out of this, Lord. I, you know, I know you died for me and stuff, but can you just not ask anything of me? Folks, let's not be that way. Let's act. Let's trust God. Let's see what he wants to do with it. Um, got a couple minutes if Pastor wants to do something with that. Yeah.